This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. Let's be attentive and present. Let's listen diligently to the words of our Lord. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that you do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down for my own accord, of my own accord. And I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this commandment from my Father. These, this is the word of the Lord. Happy are they who hear these words, believe, believe it, and obey it. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Hallelujah. 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 Heavenly Father, illuminate us, enliven us today with your word. Open our ears that we may hear fresh and new ideas and perceptions that will change us and transform us more into your likeness. And we pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we are blessed. How many of you are thankful for something today? Being grateful is a powerful thing. I am grateful because today, one of the most profound shepherds and friends that I have ever associated with over the period of almost 20 years now is here with us. Bishop Cyril is here with us from Texas today. I want you to know something about Bishop Cyril. You, he, you haven't seen a lot of him, some of you, but he is one of the founders of the COCOA. In fact, I'll go so far as to say that everything we've done here, he's a founder of because he has over the years sacrificed personally and from his community time, treasure, and talent to ensure that this cathedral seat is healthy. We need to thank God for a man like that. He's also a man that knows all my secrets because he's who I confess to. If some of you wonder, well, who does Bishop answer to? The man that I confess my weakness and sins to is sitting right here. He knows my flaws, my imperfections. We share intimately what we're supposed to share in life to grow because you can never be transformed until you become intimate and confess your weakness to another person. Because that's what Jesus gave us the power to do, is to hear one another's confession and to forgive one another with no strings attached. Amen? Some of us, are, our lives are struggling because we're independent and isolated and we're running our own life. And I always say this, if you think you're running your own life, Tell me how good it's working out for you right now. You were not designed to run your own life. You were designed to share life with the community. And I've shared life with Bishop Cyril. He's coming today with a word for this community. And we need to be thankful for a man of wisdom. This man has more wisdom in, in his little finger than most people have in their whole body. He's honest. What you see is what you get. And, you know, there's no frills 
or spills <laughs> to the deal. If you want to change, he has the words that will help you change. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and welcome his grace, Mar Bishop Cyril from Andrews, Texas. Praise God. Sit down, I ain't nobody. I am more excited about anything in the world than I see all these young people. The only problem with kids is they bring their parents. <laughs> They're always wanting to argue and fight about stuff, you know. Me and the kids, we get along good. You know, today in our society, responsibility is something we don't see a whole lot of because it's always somebody else's fault. You know, the scripture today is talking about what Christ has done for you. Neil Armstrong said it's not what you can do for your country, but what you can do, what the, not what the country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. It's not what about God can do for you. It's about what you can do for God. You know, it's time we stepped up to the plate. You know, I was really excited when we got into orthodoxy because I heard the bells on the thoroughfare. I thought that was the bells on the reindeer. Santa Claus was coming with a bunch of gifts. I was a good Protestant. And God was basically my Santa Claus. I had to come to church to tell him what all I needed. And if I didn't go to church, I was a bad boy, so he didn't like me. So I had to be a good boy, so he would like me. Now, I know none of y'all have experienced that, but bear with me as I share my spirit and soul with you. You know, the scripture today says Christ laid his life down. Nobody took it. You understand that. He laid it down. But he laid it down so he could also take it up again. We all out here want to say we've laid our lives down. But have you taken your life back up? Or are you just trying to live in the fantasy of what Christ did for you? You know, Jesus said in John 14, 12, he said, and I'll kind of summarize this, the things that I have done, you will do. So laying your life down is something that you are supposed to do. Picking your life up again, what does that even mean? You know, I, I'm a guy, I've been, I've been to church, I've been kicked out of more churches than y'all all been in. Because I always had questions. You know, I wanted to know. Don't you, like, don't you want to know the answer to some of the hard things? And, and you know, if I come and I tell you, you need, to do, you need to pick your life up. There's nothing wrong with me saying that, but I need to also tell you how to do that, should I not? You know, I always, always leave church and they say, how was your, oh, it was great. This guy said so much. Well, how do you do that? I'd go, I don't know. Probably because the guy that preached it, he didn't know either. That's what you call a hireling. You see, if we're not willing to walk, if I'm not willing to walk with you on the mountaintop and in the valley, through the mud, then you need to get as far away from me as you can. We need to walk it with people. That's what a lumen is about later on this afternoon. It's walking with people, not just in the good times, not just when I can instruct you and you can look up to me and, and clap for me when I take the podium because I'm so cool. So you can walk with me when things aren't very pretty. When we're not winning the race at that particular moment. So let's go on here. Should we... We should lay our lives down and we should lift them up. You see, we were created in the likeness and the image of God. When original sin took place, we lost our likeness. You understand what I'm talking about? If I lose you at some point, raise your hand. I'm in no hurry. 
We have to regain the likeness of God. We lost that. So we need to understand here that we weren't... Jesus didn't go to the cross so you could go to heaven and not go to hell. I hate to bust your bubble. That is not, has nothing to do with what he went to the cross for. The original gospel says that he took on our humanity or our flesh. God came in flesh and he took on our humanity. In order to purify, heal, illumine, and transfigure it. We are saved from something. Name, not hell. Namely, death, sin, and the devil. In order to be saved to something else. Union and communion with God. This is a journey. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a journey of ever deepening love that lasts for eternity because God is an eternal being. So at this point where, where we decide to lay our lives down, you know, we say, you know, here guys all the time. I come from a country, you know, in the oil field and everybody's tough. So, you know, I'd, I'd die for my family. Would you lay your life down though? See, probably when somebody breaks in your house with a gun or something, you ain't got no choice. I'm going to kill you anyway. But will you lay your life down? On Sunday afternoon, on my birthday, on Father's Day, when I want to go play golf and my wife wants me to do something with the kids, will I say, well, sure, honey. Well, I guess so. It's my birthday. Huh? You know, when are we going to grow up and be men and women of God and realize our life is not ours? My life belongs to you. It don't belong to me. Because you are God in this earth. You are Christ in this earth. It's, it's not you that sees the God in me. It's the God in you that sees the God in me. It's not you that sees the Christ in me. It's the Christ in you that sees the Christ in me. It's not the Holy Spirit that hears me by you. It's not you that hears the Holy Spirit, but it's the Holy Spirit in you that hears the Holy Spirit. You have to subject yourself to that and follow them. You have a responsibility. You know, I used to, before, before I ever met the Lord, and uh, I met him because he found me. I didn't find him because I'll be honest with you, I wasn't looking for him. <laughs> you know, my mother would call me and say, you going to church this morning? I said, well, hell no. I'm not going. Why would I want to go to church? I'm not ready to live that life. I'm having fun. Which, which is, that was a lie. I felt lost. I felt angry. I felt lonely. I felt insecure. Now, nobody knew that because that was the me that I didn't let you see. That was the reality I created, not the real reality I had to walk in. So, when we start looking at what we're saved from and what we're saved to, as we see that we should lay our life down or actually we could rename that our will are you willing to lay your will down and pick up God see Jesus said in 14 12 you the things I've done you're going to go do right y'all all want to do that this is yes and this is no yeah see Jesus was in the garden and remember he said not my will father Yours be done. Are you, are you willing to say that? Well, sure you've said that. Now the question is, are you really willing to do it? And why should we do it? Why should we do God's will instead of our will? 
See, one time I, I kept reading through the scripture and everything, everything I saw said, glorify me, glorify me, pray to me, lift me up, talk about me. I thought, boy, God's egotistical. You wouldn't think anything like that. See, when I think it, I might as well say it because he already knows it. And I need to understand why he isn't egotistical, right? So if, if God wants me to glorify him, what does it mean for me to glorify God? You ever thought about that? It's the reason they kept kicking me out of church. I had questions they didn't want to answer because they couldn't. To glorify God means to become like Christ. That's the only glory that's ever been in this, this earth in the form of God. That's Christ. We are called to be like that. Now then, when I glorify God by becoming like Christ, who does that benefit? God or me? Benefits you, dude. You can't benefit God. He's got it all. God is all about you. God is not about him. When you become like Christ, it helps you. Then you hear the Holy Spirit. Then you don't make all these wrong moves. You're benefited by that. So the... In the early church, they taught that salvation was twofold, not singular. Well, I believe Jesus died on the cross, raised from the dead, forgives my sins. Now I'm on my way to heaven. Let's go sit down and have a pina colada. Something out there is going to happen sooner or later, and I'm ready. No, you're not ready. Salvation is twofold. Number one, it's objective salvation. The object of Christ's death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into heaven... And God sending the Holy Spirit was an objective salvation to save all mankind. Amen. Subjective salvation is when I say, not my will, Father, but yours be done. I have realized what Christ did. I've been born again now. My eyes and ears are open. And I hear God and I say, I want to do it your way, not my way because that hadn't been working out too well. So now I'm willing to walk with you, as Jesus said in the garden, not my will, right? So now we're going to do what Jesus did, right? We're going to die and pick our lives up again and say, not my will, Father, but yours be done. Where would you have me go? What will you have me do? Now when you say that, you've got to be ready to go do what he says. You know, it's not like you've got a list of stuff and, oh, well, let's see, I'll take uh, 4B. No, no. You'll take whatever the Father speaks in your heart because that, why is that? Because that's what's best for you. You've got to remember, let's go back a step. Now, God's not about him, he's about you. See, when you die to yourself, you're no longer, I'm no longer about me. I'm no longer about me. I'm about you. When you start being about someone else other than you, God starts being all about you. And when God starts being all about you, let me tell you something. I'm not saying I've arrived anywhere. Please, please understand what I'm saying. But I'm telling you that I live a life that I'm excited to get up on Monday morning. And I'll be 72 in November, and I shouldn't even be this excited about anything, probably. <laughs> or so they tell me. But I'm excited about life. I enjoy life. There is nothing in the world. I've done, I was telling them yesterday, I've been to three county fairs and a goat roping. And I've seen about all this life has to give. You know, I've tried them all three or four times because I was a slow learner. But I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing in this world 
There is nothing that this world has to offer to compare to the life I have in Christ Jesus. And, and you, need, you need to understand that. Because God has things for you you don't have any comprehension of. And the only way you're ever going to experience that is when you subject. You see, we're all wanting God to prove himself to us. We need to prove ourselves to God. We need to prove ourselves to God. Because God has a, a, a kingdom for us to walk in that is absolutely amazing. You don't have to worry any longer. You know, we, this subjective salvation we need to pursue is all about using your free will. You know, sometimes it's hard to do that because you've got to be cool, right? I mean, you can't be too Christian. Well, you know, I mean, they're mostly sissies and, you know, mostly just women do that. This is what I went through as a young man. It's what I believed. You know, most of them wore their pants up like here. And the church was 75% women. I didn't want any part of that. So when the Lord called my name, I was the baddest dude on the block. And I come to find out, after I gave my life to the Lord and, and he called my name and I started trying to serve him, that having people afraid of you is not what you want. Then I tried to start reversing my life because I wanted to talk to people. Nobody wanted to talk to me because they knew me in my small town and they were afraid of me. Well, how do you witness to somebody that's afraid of Of course, if you tell them, I led a guy to the Lord in a headlock one time. That's the gospel. That actually happened with an interpreter because he was Hispanic. He couldn't tell what I, he didn't know what I was saying. Now, I'm sure that guy was really impressed with the God in me. But ever since I've met God, I've been passionate. I had a preacher tell me one time, he said, you're the only guy I know that will give God gray hair. But let's be wild people for God. You, want, you think you're a, a bad dude? You think you're the most gorgeous woman in the world? Let's use what it is God's give you to serve Him and help others. It's time to step up and be counted for. Subjective salvation comes only as we pursue God with all that we are, with all our lives, and in the reality God has for us, not the false reality we've created. When you start doing this, here's what's going to happen in closing. When you start pursuing subjective salvation, which is the will of God and the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, your big bad self that you project to everybody else, you start leaving that loneliness in your heart behind. That helpless feeling, I know you're tough, I know you got it all figured out, but that helpless feeling you have when all the lights go out and it's just you by yourself. I know how tough you are. I know how you get it all figured out, but I also know how your heart weeps inside of you and you feel helpless and alone. That's going to go away. When you start to make decisions and, and you're, you're confused, you think you want to do this, you think you want to, and you just don't know what to do. See, James, not John 3.16, James 3.16 says where there's strife and envy and selfish ambition, there's confusion in every evil work. You wonder why you're confused? Because you're just thinking selfish. Jesus laid his life down so you could lay yours down.
we and you need to make a decision. Now, I've told God several times, why don't you just let me go back to, like, the Baptist church or something and sit on the back row and just, you know what I'm talking about? Because the, the first thing that I started detesting about this, this Christian walk that God was taking me into when I met Bishop Gregory was all you people in my life. I didn't, I didn't want you in my life. I had my life pretty well together. I, I, I liked to hunt, I liked to fish, I liked to play golf. And I didn't need a whole bunch of sniveling, crying little people in my life to cloud up my view of those things. So one of my deacons one time, we were just, he became a deacon later. We were meeting in my house. There was about, we had about 80 people showing up at my house every Monday. And I started teaching this, and it whittled down to about 40. When I started teaching, we are the Christ of this earth. And he asked me one day, I was kind of in a funk. And he asked me one day, he said, what's wrong with you? I said, I can tell you what's wrong with me. You and them other 40 idiots that's in my house. <laughs> and he said, you're, a, you're at a decision point, aren't you? And just walked off. Because that's exactly where I was. It was going to either his will or my will. I had to make a decision. Fun, fun and games were over. Now it's time where the rubber meets the road. You going to step up or are you going to back down? That's where I can see in the spirit a bunch of y'all here today are. I want to tell you young people something. You don't have to take... You, you need to take the road I took because that teaches you discipline and a lot of reality about God you won't get by what I can tell you. You need to get down in the mud knee deep. But there's a lot of things I went through you don't have to go through. You, you don't have to do it the way I did it. You can walk in the kingdom of heaven and in the kingdom of heaven there is nothing there is nothing you need that's not there, not there in abundance. At my church, I have a big bowl of candy down by, by my chair. And the kids come down there and the parents say, let them have one. I said, you be quiet. This is my candy. Right? And if they want to get a double fistful and fill their pockets full... That's what I want them to do because that's the way it is in the kingdom of heaven. God don't say to you, no, nah, just, just get a little bit. God says, load up. So you don't understand that theory because you're seeing a God that wants to judge you, get glory for himself, and you don't understand what the kingdom of heaven is even about. The kingdom of heaven is about setting you free. It's about taking the chains and the bondage that you're under off. I've got a grandson that just got signed at a, a junior college to play golf. And of course now when you play golf in school or football or back, whatever it is, you want to sign at LSU. Right? Or Texas University in Austin. So he come over to me and we were talking about what he was going to do when he got out of high school. And I said, well... You're fixing to go, now he, he's 5'10", 185, and about 3% body fat. And he hits the ball like the pros. And, and he said, what advice do you have? For, he listens to me. He was raised in this faith. It's the only thing he's ever known. So he said, what, what, what advice do you have? I said, well, you're fixing to go from, from uh, big dog to hot dog. Yeah, you the stud now, and everybody looks up to you, but you fix and go to college, you're going to be the hot dog. 
you need some people around you that, that love you, like me and your mom and daddy and Mimi. So he said, rather than go all, he's going to Midland College, which is like 40 miles from us. He said, I want to be there in that process so you can minister to me spiritually. So one of the kids got a scholarship at like LSU. He said, well, I'm going to LSU. He said, you're going where your mom and daddy and all your friends think you ought to go. I'm going where I want to go. For 18 years old, that's a lot of wisdom. That's a lot of wisdom. I want to encourage you young people. I want to encourage you young people. Get you a mentor. Get you a mentor, a spiritual father, and let them take you into the fullness of God. And you will live a life like a king. Amen? Let's lay our lives down and pick up the likeness of God and become as much like Christ as we possibly can. If I took too long, I'm sorry. I love you guys. Have a great day. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet for a minute. I want everyone to stand. Alex, if you would activate the music for a second. I, I don't know if you realize how simple but profound the gospel is. Everybody close your eyes for just one second. I'm asking you to close your eyes because I want you to think of your, your own life right now. It takes help to lay down our life. I am too selfish and too self-centered and too fearful of discomfort to lay down my life by myself. So I need assistance from people who love me so that I can become a better person for my family and my community. It takes more courage to lay down your life than it does to fight for your life. We have a generation right now who says, I'm tough because I'll fight for my life. But I'm telling you, it takes more of a human to lay down their life rather than fight for it. So I don't know where you're at today, but I know what's going to happen this afternoon for young men is that the reason they're in prison and in jail is because they never learned to lay down their life for somebody else. They spent their whole life protecting themselves. And the only way out of that is to take the words Bishop Cyril said today, and I'm speaking to the men now, man up. Because only a man will say, I'm ready to lay my life down for others. It's not about my life anymore. It's about my family. It's about my community. It's about the next generation. And women, you have done an unbelievable job of holding the church together for a long time, and you are equal with a man. There's neither, no, in the spirit, there's neither male nor female, but we have to pray for the men of the next generation to quit playing with toys and games and quit living in a fantasy world and lay down our lives so that we can take up our life in Christ and reach in that bowl of candy and grab handfuls and handfuls until our pockets are stuffed and go share it with people who's never tasted the sweetness of the kingdom. Believing in God is not about believing. It's about giving yourself permission to die to yourself. I will never die for a belief system. You're not called to die for what you believe. You're called to die for your brethren. And I'm here today to say that God is doing something in Denver, Colorado. He's doing something in this community that is going to cause a light to shine in this dark, confused world where men who were once pussies become men of God.
And I'm sorry if that term, I'm talking about we need to be bulldogs for God, wild men for God. And today, I want to thank every one of the faithful women, mothers, daughters in this house because you have given this house permission to let the men step up and grow up and lay their life down. Father, help us today. As we take the Eucharist, we take the words of our bishop. We take the words of grace that he has given us. Yes, Lord. And we take up the mantle and courage to lay down our life like our Lord did so we can pick up his life and share it with the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, amen. Let us profess our faith.